Okay, I have started the recording. So good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the second session of Get Ready for 2050, a unique webinar series for local and regional authorities and their stakeholders to support them on uh, how to develop, implement and finance climate and energy plans. Today we are diving into uh, the main topic, which is sound and effective uh, climate and energy planning. Um, I'm representing today a, a large panel of organizations, initiatives and projects working on this. Uh, the main organizers are the C-Track 50 and Pentelix and H2020 projects. Uh, these are our final conferences and the Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy Europe. Uh, but also today we have uh, some other interesting projects with us, Prospect 2030, Joint CCAP, the European Energy Award and their current projects, Implement and Come Easy. Um, and uh, yes, so without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker. We are very uh, pleased to have today with us Christopher Algren from DG Klima, who is uh, in charge of policy development in the area of adaptation to climate change. So Christopher, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Melissa, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you today. And so with the topic of today focusing on successfully planning for the future, I think that this is very much a, a challenge for cities and regions, but also for countries and, and Europe as a whole. But I think it's important to keep in mind that a lot has happened just in the last couple of years with the Paris Agreement six years ago and, and really cities and regions showing that they were willing to lead the way and, and, and do more. And really sustainability is one of these areas really where Europe is leading the way and, and kind of pioneering action on a global scale. I think the, the European Green Deal presented in 2019 is, is a good example of this with the goals towards achieving climate neutrality by, by 2050, but also strengthening the 2030 climate and energy targets and adapting to climate change. And, and for an example, as part of that, we, we saw that the EU adopted a, a new climate adaptation strategy earlier this year. But really that these goals will only be possible if we ensure that everyone is on board and, and that no one is left behind as part of this sustainability transition. And it really requires an, an increased engagement with citizens, with businesses and, and other local stakeholders. And this can be done in many different ways. But one example is the European Climate Pact. And I think that in many ways, cities and towns and, and regions are really best placed to encourage this kind of local actions. And this webinar series focuses on getting ready for 2050. That's only 29 years away. It's actually not that long when we think about it. And I think a lot of good things have been done in, in the past 10, 15 years, but really we need to speed up this transformation, not only to prevent climate change, but also to make cities more livable and, and ensuring a better quality of life for our citizens. And there are many different initiatives to, to promote this, both in, in the member states, but also in the EU. And you mentioned, Melissa, the EU covenant of mayors. And this year has really been a very important milestone for the covenant of mayors to really assess and, and take stock of what has been achieved to date and, and to see did we reach the 2020 targets that we set but also as an opportunity to to see how can we increase the ambition and do more not only in light of, of the eu's more ambitious targets but really also that but new technological developments that renewable energy and, and electric cars and, and these solutions are, are more competitive than they were 10, 15 years ago, but also citizens movements like the Fridays for Future movement and how, how do we plan for the future when citizens are demanding more than they maybe did in the past. And on the 21st of April this year, mayors and local leaders endorsed a new vision for the, the Covenant of Mayors initiative with a, a new EU covenant commitment that increases ambition for 2030 and 2050. And as part of this, there are some changes. And, and one part of this is really the recognition that cities face different challenges, whether they're from the north, the south, east or western Europe. And 
as part of this, we've introduced a differentiated approach so that allows front running and, and pioneering cities to pursue climate neutrality in, in the next 5, 10, 15 years if they want to do that, but also allowing other cities to, to catch up and, and align their efforts to, to the targets of the member states. And in practice, this means that we are letting the cities themselves set the targets that they want and to really build on what has achieved by, by 2020. And we'll discuss this more in detail in the thematic breakout sessions later this morning and how to make this happen in practice and how to successfully plan for climate neutrality and climate adaptation and to make sure that we're ready for the future and, and 2050. So with that said, I, I want to thank all of you for participating here today and I'm really looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher, for this nice introduction. I think what I will take out from this is that there are many, many ways that citizens, cities and regions can uh, can get involved into climate and energy and can support the EU in achieving uh, our global objectives and achieve carbon neutrality. So uh, if you have questions for Christopher, just wait a little bit longer. We first have two more presentations. Uh, but uh, you can already ask your questions in the chat, of course, or through Slido. You have here the QR code, you will see it uh, in a bit as well, because the next speaker already has a, a question for you. So please uh, join us on Slido as well and, uh, and ask questions to Christopher and other speakers. Thank you again, Christopher. Now let's move to our second uh, presentation. It is time for me to introduce Andriana Stavakaki, sorry, from EPTA. Uh, so my colleague from c 50 project, and you will then hear more about this project and uh, how to reach a carbon neutral future. So Alexandra, I will give you control of your presentation now and you have the floor. Okay, good morning from me as well. Um, before I start my presentation, um, I would also like to ask you to um, uh, join Slido and answer uh, the following question, basically. Has your municipality region taken up the challenge of carbon neutrality? And if so, by when? Um, there's four options. Uh, so no, the municipality has not, the region has not. Uh, no vision or no commitment or no plan or it's not developing a plan. And yes, it has uh, by 2030, 40 or 50. Uh, I'll give a few seconds for people to respond. Thank you everyone for participating. Um, it's quite interesting to see that there, there's a significant number of uh, municipalities and regions that have not taken up the challenge of carbon neutrality. Uh, and why should they? Well, first of all, uh, cities are the ones that are more, most impacted by climate change and they suffer the consequences of climate change, such, such as floods, droughts, and other extreme weather events but also they can really have an impact, especially when you consider that more than 80% of the energy consumed is within cities. Uh, and most importantly, cities and at the second degree regions are the closest to the people. So they're the government level closest to the people and really do understand local needs, priorities and problems. Uh, so they really do have an important role um, in leading the way to carbon neutrality, implementing national and EU policies and facilitating um, sustainable solutions in many sectors, uh, as well as managing public funds. So I'll quickly go to my presentation now and uh, give you an overview of C-Track 50 and then move on to long-term energy and climate planning. So C-Track 50 has involved local authorities and regions um, in across Europe, as you can see in 11 uh, European countries and helping them um, take up the challenge of carbon neutrality. So the, the, the key objectives of the project is to mobilize local and regional authorities uh, but also to actually provide support for them in developing uh, integrated sustainable energy and climate actions 
that aim for carbon neutrality and climate resilience by 2050. In parallel, we're also supporting uh, these local authorities to develop um, funding proposals and facilitate the financing of specific actions within uh, these uh, plans uh, so that they can start implementing them. And lastly, but important as well is enabling multi-level governments so the collaboration between different levels of governments both horizontally and vertically which is very important in facilitating the implementation but also the design of actions uh, this slide presents the results of C-Track 50 so 107 local authorities have been uh, facilitated to develop their plans for 2050 with the vision of carbon neutrality and 11 regions have been supported to either develop a plan or develop recommendations documents for carbon neutrality you can see the impact uh, in terms of energy savings, renewable energy production, and also carbon dioxide um, emission reduction. Uh, and on the left side, you can see the impact of the, pro uh, the project in terms of investments triggered. So uh, 50 million uh, euro have already been approved by uh, funding proposals submitted, and there's another 72 million which uh, is, is currently being evaluated. And finally, the project has also uh, really engaged with civil servants and helped them build their capacity and train them throughout the long term energy planning process. So the slide uh, summarizes the project, the, the process of uh, energy and climate planning, basically, which is the same for long term, short term and medium term. There's three steps, setting a vision for 2050, which includes also developing the appropriate structures within the municipality or region that can support the vision, help form it and also develop the plan and the actions. The second step is to assess the current situation, so understand the local context, understand uh, the energy consumption within the territory, which sectors are important, but also understand the risks and vulnerabilities of the territory and of the different sectors. And lastly, the third step is to turn the vision into action. So basically, identify appropriate actions, uh, prioritize them and design them in order to then implement them and, and monitor them. In all these steps, it's very important to have civil servants that have the capabilities of, of doing these, this process, so training and capacity building is very important, but it's equally important to involve stakeholders and citizens throughout the process, so a participatory approach um, helps the design of the plans and also the implementation of the plans as Basically, uh, it ensures the buy-in of citizens and stakeholders and can facilitate the implementation later on. Um, uh, Multi-level governance is also very important in the, the, the three steps um, because it can ensure synergies between different actions and different government levels. In terms of C-Track 50, a number of uh, recommendations, considerations have emerged that are more specific for long-term energy planning um, that aims for carbon neutrality. Uh, and the first one is to set intermediate targets, so basically plan, but also have specific targets uh, and design actions according to these targets so that the longer vision can be achieved. This not only helps the implementation, but also monitoring progress and being able to evaluate um, the plans as time passes. It's equally important to adopt a holistic approach, so basically consider all key sectors for the municipality, for the local authority and its activities. So, for example, this is different from municipality to municipality. Uh, rural municipalities, for example, um, should consider agriculture if that's a significant uh, sector for their, their territory. Uh, and it's also important to link these energy and climate plans with other existing relevant plans, whether these are in municipal level, such as a waste management plan or regional or national level. Um, local authorities really need to be ambitious when they develop these plans uh, for the municipal sector as well. So uh, with this way, they can lead by example and motivate citizens and stakeholders to implement similar solutions and similar actions. Um, and they should also in, engage the energy efficiency principle, energy efficiency first principle, which basically um, means that by reducing emissions, then there's a smaller need to produce energy. So by reducing uh, sorry, energy consumption, there's a smaller need to uh, produce energy. Uh, and equally important to, of course, facilitate the uptake of renewable energy sources in the long term. 
local authorities should also uh, consider the local conditions, especially when promoting available technologies and solutions. So for example, if there's a district heating network, um, then in the long term, they should move to the use of clean fuels. And linked to this is avoiding carbon locking and maladaptation. So for example, actions that uh, focus on adapting to climate change should not increase greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and actions that uh, focus in achieving targets in the short term or medium term uh, should not impede uh, actions in, in the long term that will help achieve carbon neutrality. So for example, um, focusing only on a switch from heating oil in buildings to natural gas and not considering other low carbon technologies and renewable energies for the future. Um, finally, uh, local authorities need to consider the most vulnerable within their territory, so they need to make sure that the actions they include in their plans do not exacerbate the problem of energy poverty or increase social inequalities. We've developed within the framework of the project a guidebook for local authorities and regions uh, to help them achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. This will soon be available, will be published by the end of June in English and in the 10 um, languages that the project uh, uh, focuses on. It includes key steps in the planning process, key considerations, but also best practices across Europe, which uh, hopefully will inspire cities and regions uh, better design and also implement uh, action in the future. Before I go, um, I would uh, like to ask you to ask, answer another slider question, which will hopefully uh, trigger discussions in one of the breakout uh, sessions later on. So uh, in your opinion, what are the challenges for achieving carbon neutrality in your municipality and region? Thank you. In the meantime, uh, Andrea and I, I already want to, to thank you for uh, your presentation. I think the audience can really see uh, that all of the advice you mentioned come from years of supporting municipalities and within c 50 it's been uh, three intense years of working directly with municipalities. So uh, you will get the slides later on. Uh, I really advise you to pay attention to this nice and practical advice on on how to help municipalities with their objectives. And uh, as Andriana mentioned, if you are uh, allocated and have chosen the room on carbon neutrality uh, in the second part of the seven, you will uh, get the chance to uh, dig deeper on this topic. So not surprising, uh, always lack of funding, right? Yes. Cars and transport, this is interesting as well. So yes, the transport sector seems to be an important challenge for most local authorities. That's very interesting because in, in the session we'll go on and talking about challenges and solutions. Thank you everyone for your uh, input. Thank you very much, Andriana. Um, so don't forget to ask your questions through the chat or to Slido, uh, but we first have a uh, another presentation before the first Q&A. Now it is time to welcome Anna Lovrak from the University of Zagreb and the coordinator of the Pentahelix project. So Anna, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Melissa. And uh, thank you all of you for joining this uh, session in the name of the uh, also Pentahelix Consortium, who is one of the co-organizer of these uh, sessions. So as uh, Melissa said, my name is Anna Lovrak. I work at the University of Zagreb, Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture. And together with my colleagues, I coordinate the Pentahelix project. And today I will present you a multi-stakeholder approach in energy and climate plan planning, or as we call it, Pentahelix approach, which we developed in our project. So at the beginning, I would like to ask you one slide of question, and I will kindly ask you to rate drivers for the energy and climate measure implementation. And in your slide, please 
click one for the, uh, first uh, for the driver which you find the most relevant and the two, three, four, five, six for the drivers which you find less relevant. So here you can see we have six drivers. Those are lower vulnerability to climate change, financial savings, greenhouse emission savings, energy savings, uh, unemployment reduction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll wait a few more seconds so more of you could uh, could uh, answer the slide of question. Okay, we have 30 answers. So yeah, those are interesting results. I see that you find the most relevant, the energy savings, financial savings, and the uh, greenhouse emission savings. So yeah. um, <laughs> could you please just turn off your mic? Uh, and uh, those results are similar <laughs> like uh, results with, which we had in our research on in the scope of the project. Uh, to some extent, but to first to, in our uh, research, the two most relevant drivers were greenhouse emission savings and energy savings, but it seems that financial savings are now also considered very important. Maybe this is also due to this economic crisis, so we are now also more focused on the economy. So here you can see the drivers uh, which were uh, considered the most relevant in our research, and also on the right, you can see the barriers which um, uh, which we selected and uh, in which were selected in uh, in our survey in Norway, Croatia, Belgium, Latvia, Spain, and uh, other EU countries on which buyers are the most relevant for the sake of development. So, as you can see here, the distribution is quite equal, but the two of the most relevant uh, barriers uh, selected were lack of information about the benefits of sustainable energy and climate action plan and lack of showing the importance of stakeholder participation and support. So um, in addition to this, we made a comprehensive research on uh, more uh, barriers and drivers on the importance of the stakeholder inclusion and uh, other relevant topics uh, related to the, um, to the energy and climate measures. So I would kindly ask you if you have some time to check our library and to download the barriers and drivers database. Oops, sorry some technical issues. So uh, as you can see, one of the main barriers for the implementation of the energy and climate measures is this a lack of importance of stakeholder involvement. So this stakeholder involvement is the key of our project. And uh, in the scope of our project, we developed the Pentahelix uh, guidelines, uh, which are based on uh, task establishment of the task force groups. And those task force groups should be established to structure the involvement process and ensure that all parts of the society are involved. So when I say uh, structure, here is different that we don't have a certain consultation uh, for uh, one time with uh, citizens or with other stakeholders, but we have established group of people who is uh, included as early as possible at the very uh, early stage of the second development and this working together on the second development, but more important on the second implementation in the later phase. And uh, at least one actor from each of the, penta from the pillars, public authorities, industry, academia, NGOs and citizens should be included in this task force uh, group. So here you can see a picture of one task force group. For the task force group, this is a quite big group, uh, but we have a big interest. It is important to not have too big groups so to have um, construction discussion. Just a sec, okay. So I think I skipped one slide. So application of the paint helix approach, just to give example uh, on how we did this in our uh, project. So uh, task force meetings are organized in cities and municipalities and is the very early stage of the sake of development stakeholders propose mitigation and climate adaptation measure. So and sometimes it is not so easy to propose already some mitigation and climate adaptation measures. 
uh, it is sometimes easier for the citizens and for the other stakeholders to say what is their need or what is the need of the city and then the SECAP uh, consultation uh, or regional Ag energy agency who is developing SECAM, SECAM can take this into consideration and develop a measure in accordance with that. Once the measures are developed, they comment and, and amend those measures. And uh, in parallel to this process, task force group will find the stakeholders responsible for the implementation of certain measures. Uh, and uh, once the SECAP is developed, the stakeholders cooperate in the implementation of the measures. So few of the benefits of this integrated approach uh, to planning and implementation in uh, comparison with traditional approach uh, is that as uh, there is, uh, and this traditional approach, last week I was on a one workshop of the Prospect 2030, and one of the speakers said that uh, very often the second development process is a silent process where the stakeholders are not involved. So uh, one of the benefits is a step up from the generic measures to measures tailored to the city, municipalities and stakeholders. So if you maybe look for um, not maybe so much setups but more steps, you can see practically the same measures in um, each city of, of some country or even in uh, different countries. So there is, as I said, the, the mayors are, measures are more tailored to the city and municipalities. Getting a broader picture of the impact of certain measures on other sectors. So uh, during our project implementation, we noticed that sometimes the, those who develop setups are not aware on how different measures affect uh, certain sectors. For example, we had an example where uh, district heating company was explaining us how the floods are um, are affecting their infrastructure. There is increase of social inclusion in the implementation of CO2 reduction measures and adaptation of climate change. Uh, there is improved coordination of measure implementation because uh, once we sit all together on the table and uh, we know and uh, we discuss who is working and what, then um, different NGOs um, explain what they are doing and maybe even the city in which they are implementing these measures are not aware of that. And uh, last, but the mo I would say the most important, that is a plan that presents realistic and preferred measures and at the same time serves to attract investment. Uh, so also, uh, Guri mentioned this uh, during uh, her presentation last week. Uh, in the scope of our project, we developed the climate communication, which are very uh, straightforward and uh, give very concrete uh, tips. So one of some of the tips for successful communications are create good meeting place, ask questions to understand, involve others, help people see the change in a positive light, uh, using good examples and make it easy to make the right cho choice. So as you can see, the climate communication guidelines are very visual attractive and I would also ask you to download them. They are available in English, but also in Norwegian, Flemish, uh, Croatian, Spanish, and Latvian. Uh, and uh, I would also like to invite you to join an online platform for second development, uh, which is available at the link you can see. Uh, this, this platform enables communication and exchange of experience. It includes free materials that can be used directly without a copyright infringement. And uh, of course, the registration is free. So instead of conclusion, I um, borrow the one picture from um, from uh, one uh, famous uh, network uh, platform, uh, and it's written there: "It takes a village to turn ideas into realities." And we also see in our uh, project implementation that this is really the case. So the stakeholder uh, stakeholder participation is indeed very important in uh, energy climate measures development and implementation. So thank you very much. Here you can see my email and also included here the logos of the Pentahelix partners. So in case if you are maybe working with some of them, you can also ask them for more information about the Pentahelix project. Thank you very much, Anna, for this nice presentation. Um, I think it's very great to see that uh, it's very complementary to what we have been doing in C-Track 50. Again, many practical advice for uh, local and regional authorities, their stakeholders, and you see you have uh, some more material and opportunities to, if you're interested in these topics in both projects. So, uh, so yeah, there is uh, more opportunities to, to learn on this and to build capacity. Um, all right, we are just in time for the first Q&A session. So let's see, 
uh, I will look at the chat. I don't think we have uh, we have questions in the chat, but we do have already one question in Slido. So I will ask our three speakers to uh, put on their webcam again, because I believe this is a general question and I would like to hear from the three of you, so Christopher, Andriana and Anna. Uh, how can stakeholders supporting municipalities convince them to take on carbon neutrality as an objective? Uh, indeed, uh, this can be scary, carbon neutrality. Uh, it's quite a big challenge. So what would be your advice for stakeholders to convince municipalities? Uh, Anna, I see already you are on the screen, so you can start maybe with your opinion on this. Yes, indeed, uh, this is um, quite challenging, and uh, I would say that it's um, quite easier if the situation is no, uh, is different. That the municipality is uh, convincing stakeholders to take on carbon neutrality and not vice versa. Um, well. Maybe I would also ask Adriana, I would like to think a bit more because um, the, as you can see, the political will is, and you can, as you can see also on the slide of uh, answers, the political will is in very important in this process. So yeah, maybe I would like to ask Adriana to answer, then I would think a bit more on this question. Adriana, please go ahead. Um, yes, uh, 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 for us uh, from C Track 50, it was very important uh, to actually show and, and talk to the municipalities and talk about the importance of, of taking this vision forward. Um, um, as, as I mentioned in one of my slides as well, uh, cities are the ones that are most impacted by climate change. They suffer the consequences of climate change, um, and and, um, and and people are starting to see it. So these effects are, are will be um, will be worse in the future. Uh, so talking to cities, talking to local authorities, and explaining um, you know uh, the, the problem and how this will uh, get worse in the future, and how important it is for them to start planning for the future. Uh, is is an important point um uh, and also uh, to uh, what was very useful for us was to actually talk with the local authorities about the different solutions and actions they take, can take forward to inspire them so talk to them about best practices talk to them about what other cities are doing um and 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 having these uh uh, in person now virtual kind of discussions with them uh, to show the importance of, of taking up this uh, this uh, vision. Thank you very much. Um, and then we and have, uh, I, oh, of course, add, of course, Anna, go ahead. Uh, um, so just to add what Adriana said, we had um, not about the carbon uh, neutrality discussion, but we had a discussion about reaching in our project about reaching 55% of CO2 reduction. So uh, as in the first session, most of the municipalities said that they are not, they think that this, um, this goal is too high and for them even the 40% uh, from the comment of mayor is quite challenging. But also sometimes uh, as we see it helps if they see that uh, taking the carbon neutrality or in this case uh, having 55 uh, uh, percent of the CO2 reductions that uh, to some extent this will not be uh, the fully voluntary <laughs> decision but at the, as also the uh, Europe decided that until 2050 the Europe will be a climate neutral uh, continent so this is something what will uh, at what will uh, at some point come as uh, we can even say obligatory decisions. So maybe with the political, this is also uh, helpful for them to know this. Indeed. And, and uh, to add on, on one of the points that uh, actually Anna uh, raised is that um, it, 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 I, I, Carbon neutrality and you know these ambitious targets uh, seem very difficult for local authorities. So basically, speaking with them and explaining, um, you know that that it is a very ambitious, it is a very difficult target. Even if we're not talking about carbon neutrality, we're talking about midterm, um, like Anna was uh, um, talking about targets that are very ambitious. Uh, but also uh, discussing with them 
how these are actually feasible and giving them examples and 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 guiding them through the process because uh, it, it does look like a, you know like a very uh, difficult target to set at the local level so it's about showing them that it's a feasible target as well deconstructing this big objective into smaller achievable tasks right exactly okay and yeah, I think it's a good question because it all also shows that indeed political will is important, but sometimes you have also ambitious stakeholders supporting municipalities uh, like uh, in Federal we see, of course, energy agencies play this role and are there to, to show and to lead the way. Uh, but I would like to hear as well from Christopher, of course, a different angle, uh, the EU as the policy power, and but you also have other actions like uh, you mentioned the European Climate Pact. Uh, so what would you answer? Answer to this question. No, but I, I think that all three of you raised really good points. And, and I think from our perspective in, in the European Commission and, and something that we see a lot is really the, the kind of exchange and, and discussions between different cities. And that I think one good thing that stakeholders can do if they want to convince municipalities is to really show examples of other cities that have already started to develop in this direction and that really i mean climate neutrality is it can seem like an uh, an impossible target and, and something that is very challenging but actually it's not something that you do in a year and and but it's really something that we want to pro progress towards in the next 30 years from on a european scale and we're already building on everything that has been done since 1990 so really to to take that challenging target and and break it down into individual actions that you can take on the ground and really yeah facilitate this discussion and, and learn from other cities thank you very much the three of you um, i will take one more question from silvio addressed to andriana a more practical question but still interesting so andriana you mentioned the need to transform existing district heating systems to clean energy sources have you any examples to share for such tricky transition for large district heating systems um, uh, actually, the local authorities um, uh, I've been <laughs> supporting uh, were more medium, uh, small sized uh, municipalities that didn't have this uh, uh, this cap capacity, so they didn't have a district heating um, uh, from, let's say, industry that could be utilized. Uh, but I do understand that you know the the this can move to uh, the use of cleaner fuels, um, for example, biomass, geothermal, and so on. But I don't really have unfortunately a good example uh, as it, it wasn't uh, with the municipalities I worked with. I'm not sure if, if Anna has an example on that. Or do you know if this will be in the guidebook from some of the other partners of the c fifty project? Uh, yes, I, I think there are um, a couple of uh, examples of district heating um, uh, and, and how um, uh, district heating from industry can benefit uh, uh, the, the, the carbon transition. Uh, yes, so I'm, I'm sure there will be some good practices that can inspire you in the guidebook. I will just add, uh, yes, in, in our uh, project, we we were um, talking a lot also with the district heating company, but they had quite, um, they were quite open for the clean energy sources. But uh, I will just uh, say that um, on in our uh, group, uh, there is also uh, one more project which was, which has been implemented, but not by me, but my colleagues have been working on it. Um, it's called Keep Warm and it's dealing with this specific topic. So they are, uh, I think they have a lot of um, materials to answer this concrete uh, question. And we also have the related project going on in Federan. So, uh, so yeah, uh, Silvio, so read the guidebook and uh, investigate about key form and related would be my advice. Thank you very much for this lively discussion. Uh, unfortunately, there is another very, very interesting question, but I will uh, try to come back to it uh, at the end of the first part, because uh, keeping in mind the timing, we have to move on now to the three next presentations. So I would like to, to thank uh, all of you, Christopher, Anna, Andriana. Uh, so Christopher has to go, unfortunately, but it was really a pleasure to have you and it was great to, to also have your, your perspective uh, in this event. So now moving on. You too.
<laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Um, moving on to the next speakers. Uh, they already have a question for you, but I will already ask you to put on your, your webcam so I can introduce you. It's Tekla Heinel and uh, Charlotte Spunley. Uh, so Tekla uh, is a fellow mm -hmm. federal member, a vice president uh, for uh, climate protection in municipalities and regions in our network, but also head of department for international mm -hmm. projects at BN. BNSU and member of the European Energy Award mm -hmm. and Charlotte is general manager of the European Energy Award and mm -hmm. EEA advisor for municipalities in Switzerland since, since 15 years. So also uh, experts of the field. Uh, of course, you might have understood they will talk to you about the European Energy Award and their projects. And, uh, and this is why they want to know uh, if you're familiar with their initiative, with others, uh, this will also be useful for the discussion in the second part if you are, have been allocated and have chosen the breakout session on European initiatives. So Charlotte and Tecla, are you surprised by these results? Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> not, no, but but uh, thank you very much for this nice introduction, uh, Melissa. Um, of course, the Covenant of Mayors Europe is very well known, but I'm still surprised that many of you already know the European Energy Award. I think that's that's a good, good number. Um, indeed, we will focus with our presentation. Can I can I move the slide? Wait, I haven't. Yes, now you can. Oh, great! Thank you very much. So, okay. Oops, that's one slide too far. Yes. Um, it's a good result, and indeed, we will focus in our presentation to the uh, Covenant of Mayors Europe and the European Energy Award. As you all know, both initiatives are targeted to municipalities with the aim to foster climate policy and action. And uh, we will share our views as long term experts and from our two projects, Implement and Come Easy, which will be presented later. Um, I will start with a short introduction of the European Energy Award, even if already a lot of you know it already. Uh, I think it's it's good to have a brief explanation to, to understand all the following. So um, the EAA is uh, the European Energy Award. The EAA is, is a continuous quality and awarding system for municipality, which deals with climate policy and action as a process. Um, it enables municipalities to organize and shape the municipal climate protection policy by bringing together the different stakeholders of the administration, but also NGOs and other, other stakeholders in the energy team. This is the team is the core of the process and municipalities are supported in planning, implementing and controlling their climate policy and action. So the EEA helps to define activities and action plans, and it provides support by experience, advisors, and proven tools. I think that's a very important topic uh, also regarding what we heard already. Um, but how is the process working? Um, everything starts, you can see it over here, with the high level commitment or an official decision of the mayor and the city council. This is needed to start a process in order to assure a broad and sustainable support. Based on this, an energy team with an influential team leader is formed. It includes, as I already said, all relevant departments of the municipality, but also other important stakeholders like citizens or municipal enterprises. This is decided by, by, the, by the municipality itself according to their needs and their specific situation. The energy team is supported by an experienced EA advisor. This is very important to keep the process ongoing also for a long term. And the next step is the initial energy review. And here, the current situation, but also the potential of the municipality is analyzed and documented. And this is the background on this. They built uh, the energy policy program, which contains a definition of measures, responsible person and budgets. And it is followed by the project implementation. And if this went well, um, the municipality is audited by an external auditor. If they achieve 50% of the possible points, 
they will be awarded with the uh, European Energy Award. And if it's 75 percent, they receive the European Energy Award in gold. And at this point, the cycle starts again with a new internal review and an updated policy program. So you see it's, it's a continuous cycle and we have in the EAA uh, municipalities that are already working for many, many years uh, in this, uh, in this uh, process. And they really think that it's, it's very important for them to, uh, to continuously improve their, their situation. So what I mean is that uh, municipalities are able to assess their strengths and weaknesses in all areas that can be influenced by, by the municipality. That's very important. Um, the instruments we have are adapted to local and national contexts, but also a um, benchmark on European level is possible as the tools are aligned and balanced between the different uh, participating countries. There is a strong focus on implementation. Municipalities use a catalog of relevant and tested measures for their energy, energy policy program. So they don't need to start from the scratch again. They can benefit from, from the uh, experience of others. So it's from municipalities to municipalities. And last but not least, they can present with the, with the award their activities and profit from their success with a better visibility. I think also very important to, to show what you have done. Here we see which countries are covered. Uh, the EEA is currently available in, in all these countries on the slide. You see the dark blue countries are the long-term EEA countries like Italy, like Austria, Switzerland, Germany, France, and uh, so on. And then we have uh, the, in light blue, the pilot countries which are uh, just uh, uh, on their way to establish the EA system. And this is also the core of one of our projects, the implement project. Four of the pilot countries mentioned, Belgium, Croatia, Greece, and Poland, have started their way into the EEA in the framework of the Horizon Project implement. And the aim of this project is to establish the necessary structures, a national branch, EEA advisors, EEA auditors, uh, in the countries and adapt the necessary tools like the management tool, the, the catalog of measures I mentioned and the assessment guidance and to work with the first 30 pilot municipalities in the countries. The EEA advisors, which we have trained in the framework of the project, support and monitor the municipalities and the process in order to be in line with the necessary quality standards. The aim of the project is to roll out the EA in these pilot countries in a sustainable way and increase the capacities in the municipalities regarding the development and the implementation of climate and energy policy plans. We want to achieve, of course, like all of us, measurable CO2 and energy reduction. Finally, this project should make it motivate municipalities and their staff and make their efforts visible. In all of the countries I've mentioned, also other initiatives like the Covenant of Mayors, you know very well, are in place. And how these two initiatives create synergies for the benefit of the municipalities is the topic of the ComEasy project, which is now presented by my colleague, colleague uh, Charlotte Spurnley. Please, Charlotte. Yes, thank you, Tekla, for introducing the EA to all of you. Um, it helps me to present the, the aim and also the, the outcomes of the ComEasy project as it builds a lot actually on the EA on one hand, but also on actually the, the Covenant of Mayors, which you seem all to know very well, according to Slido, plus also some other, other initiatives like ISO standards for energy management, for example, or also some smart city initiatives. But the, our main focus of the Kamisi project was really on the two initiatives, EA and COM, with the idea to take actually the strengths of each of the initiatives and afterwards provide instruments or some additional features of the initiatives to better combine these two initiatives so that it gives you even a stronger support when 
working on, a, on an ambitious um, climate or energy strategy. You can see here the team of the Come Easy project. Again, you can see it's sort of the long-term um, EEA countries because they all have the, this EEA know-how already, all the processes implemented in, in their countries and the Covenant of Mayors is all over Europe, of course, anyway. And we had, of course, several ambassador and rollout cities joining us to test the instruments, etc. Um, what we did first is sort of to analyze what I said, the strengths of each of the initiatives, what differentiates them, also the, the gaps we have between the initiatives, and then see how we now can combine them and strengthen sort of both of them and also enable a multiple commitment of local authorities to several initiatives at the same time. You can see here again the process Tekla explained to you of the EEA a bit of a, in a different form and you can see at the same time also I think that it's basically the process is really the same for EEA and COM but on a methodological level and on some certain aspects we really focus on different things. If you go again very quickly through it you can see where we have similar similarities and where we are complementary to each other. So we have this high level commitment, which is of course an uh, extremely strong element of the covenant of mayors um, with this the commitment by the mayor and the recognition by the EU. Then we have in the EEA the formation of an interdisciplinary or interdepartmental energy team just to assure that it really goes in all the sectors, the topic. And then we have this initial energy review, which on the Covenant of Mayors is really focused on the, on the quantitative emission, on emission, this is the, the baseline emission inventory. On the other hand, with the EEA, it's much more focused on, on qualitative aspects as well, on how, for example, you, you, you do the urban planning, how, how you're organized internally, how you communicate and cooperate with the population and the industry. So it gives you additional input and as um, strengths and weakness profile on which you can afterwards with the quantitative analysis and this more qualitative and implement or implementation oriented um, initial energy review, it gives you a very good basis to afterwards build your action plan. So there you have the action plan, you have of course project implementation. And then what's another additional element um, of the EA that could also be used for the COM elements is that we have that we all, always work with um, accredited EA advisors, which mandatorily coach uh, an EA municipality through this whole process and in all the steps. And afterwards, um, what we have in addition in this cycle is a, an external audit all for years, which of course assures the quality. It really brings in an element of quality assurance in this whole um, system. And another element of motivation for the municipalities as we award and, and label them once they've got enough points. To, to get a bit more maybe precise on what we really developed also on, on the level of tools in the Come Easy project, um, you can of course find them all on our homepage, um, you, you see there or you can ask me afterwards, um, you can see the tools developed here. Um, this is, for example, one example of a tool we've developed in our EA online tool. To It basically mirrors the, the, the emission inventory of the Covenant of Mayors, which facilitates it for um, EA municipalities as they can now report to EEA and also have all the data they need for the Covenant of Mayors reporting in the same tool. So it's what we call the emission pass tool. And at the same time, we added some more additional features, like for example, that you can compare a, your local um, reduction path you defined on a policy level, and um, you can compare it to the national reduction path or, or to the EU reduction path. And we've also added a, a scenario uh, model where you can sort of work with different scenarios and different reduction paths. Um, another tool um, that's um, very simple, actually Excel-based um, is for example, this mitigation impact calculator, um, 
which helps you estimate the CO2 and cost savings you get from typical, um, um, typical, typical action. Um, you've defined, be it for example, retrofitting of buildings or be it replacement of, of bulbs, um, where standard values on a national or even international level are in the tool which you can use or overwrite just as two examples of, of concrete results. And just to assure you, um, now I can't move the slides and yes, oh, sorry. Um, the, we have had this cooperation between EA and COME during this COME Easy project, but of course it will not end at the end of the project. Even before the project, we have had already a collaboration. We have then signed a memorandum of understanding in 2019, and we are actually now working on an even closer link between our two online tools of the EA and COME to have an automatic import export function in the future. So our collaboration will go on even after and the Come Easy project ended. Just if you want to commit to, to both um, initiatives. So that was it from our side. I hand over to you again, Melissa. Thank you very much, Charlotte and, and Tecla for this uh, interesting presentation. It's great to see uh, the links between all the, all the initiatives and to see that they're not competing, but they're really complementary again. Uh, so I really encourage the audience, if you have questions about how to use these tools, how to uh, use them together, um, please write in the chat or in, uh, in Slido. We will take questions again uh, in a few minutes. We still have two presentations to go through first. So thank you again. I now move on to a, a slightly different topic because we've been talking a lot about municipalities for now. But uh, what about regions? Uh, this is uh, what Manfred Ottwagner from the Prospect 2030 project will talk about. So Manfred, thank you again for being there. Uh, you have. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for the possibility to present uh, our project. I'm talking about different approaches in the regional energy planning and in especially in, in energy transition planning, which is a much more proactive challenge uh, in the next two decades than than it appears to be now. But as I have seen uh, of, of speakers before, uh, the topic is uh, going to be uh, more and more uh, viral and so it's a good thing. So what are the challenges we are facing and we have to deal with? Uh, it's an, an electrification of end use sectors, a deep electrification, uh, and also a transformation of the power system. This seems common uh, knowledge, but uh, the impact is uh, that we will also have a decentralized structure in all of this. Uh, of course, energy efficiency measures, and what's not so recognized is uh, the digitalization of all these systems. So I will move on, what are we doing in Prospect 2030? Uh, we made an assessment of, of public funds on how they have been used, and we had a critical look on, uh, on the last period. So uh, we saw what has been used, what has been available, what hasn't been used, what could have been used, and what will be, uh, will be uh, helpful in the future. Um, so based on that inventory, we are also building sustainable action plans for seven Central Europe regions with very, very different backgrounds uh, regarding uh, spatial and uh, economic conditions, but also uh, regarding regulatory framework and, and levels of governance. So uh, this was uh, the challenge now uh, to have a, a coordinated procedure of developing uh, in a consortium uh, individual energy action plans is uh, to to respect these differences and also to get uh, to to find new approaches because uh, in in having comparable uh, results for for differing situations it's it's not easy uh, to to rely only on the on the instruments and and on on the approaches we have been uh, using up to now and. Uh, one of the very, very uh, important things is always training packages, exchange, mutual learning, uh, transferring good practices uh, to 
get an insight on what we are facing. So we had more or less uh, to, to develop a new approach. Uh, we call it the ecosystem approach. Uh, this is derived uh, from uh, digitalization initiatives. We are also in uh, grid digitalization, energy communities and so on. So the current approaches are well known, macro level top down, uh, micro level bottom up at the other end and in between um, the, the multi-level governance ecosystems. Uh, but if you have a look on uh, the, the image uh, uh, at the left to the bottom, uh, we have uh, an, an impression of uh, on, on the very left of the energy system as it is now or as it has been and to the uh, middle and the right, uh, the decentralized system of, uh, of the future, which is also blockchain operated, which is a big issue and will consume a lot of energy. So uh, the energy sector will have some, some self-demand also. But comparing these systems, uh, if you look to the right, uh, to the construction uh, with the numbers it, in it, it might be an atomium or something like that uh, comparable. This is uh, just an, an image of the actors in the plan planning system and in how to plan approaches. We have overarching territorial authorities. On the other end, uh, we have uh, local initiatives. We have on one hand uh, uh, possibilities to create framework. On the other hand, there is no framework available or a little framework. We So we need to coordinate um, and, and, and combine initiatives on one level. How do we do that? Uh, we are using a standardized method for all types of, we call it ecosystems, because they are interactive uh, uh, components uh, in a framework of uh, framework conditions. So for describing and analyzing and comparing, plus uh, in the end to have it better outputs and a better planning process all over Europe, uh, we have uh, a system applicable on all levels of governance, uh, providing a target and readiness focused perspective for the region. That's the role of uh, a simple impact effort analysis, uh, but also on a deeper um, uh, SWOT, which is not based on just uh, baselines, but as a tool for analyzing and optimizing the readiness of a region for certain solutions, which will have to be achieved in the future to, to, to get decarbonized systems. So the focus where we are comparable are always use of available instruments. These are instruments are business financing, funding instruments and so on. This is a ubiquitous occurrence in, in, in each uh, uh, region. So there we are comparable. And uh, built on that model, on the ecosystem model, which means ecosystems, uh, uh, Southeast Europe ecosystem to uh, very in the North ecosystem. So all over, over Europe to have instruments, actions, and of course, an intense, intense knowledge transfer necessary to cover all types of conditions where our planning bodies, let's call them, uh, are acting within and achieving uh, results. So what will you achieve? An optimization of the well-known ecosystems, we call it now ecosystems, uh, with better integration of core aspects in, 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 in planning and infrastructure, um, also on settlement development, public transport. This is for urban regions, for example. Yeah. Uh, uh, a good solution. We have on the other end uh, bottom-up ecosystems. We have seen, for example, in a in a, in a Eastern Europe uh, region, in the Danube region, um, that they, there is no subsidies for thermal ret retrofaction. They have to build initiatives on their own. There, are, so this is the other end. And in between, we have uh, the now good introduced energy planning. Uh, multi-level uh, governance ecosystems like the Austrian uh, model regions for climate and energy, 
public uh, private partnerships efficiency uh, contracting services which are between local uh, coordinated between local authorities energy agencies and uh, private companies for example yeah? so that's uh, what we want to achieve an optimization uh, of approach in in the planning process uh, having not only functional we, i was talking about functional ecosystems now but all these functional eco ecosystems are also distributed spatially uh, the focus up to now was on cities because uh, um, cities are human models <laughs> uh, with infrastructure uh, with their own challenges of course but uh, we have also very rural and even peripheral uh, regions and and here uh, this challenge is taken up now by the union by the development of the smart uh, villages uh, approach and uh, which will integrate uh, by means of digitalization also the rural and peripheral space uh, into a network of uh, of processes um, that's uh, that's necessary because efficiency is feasible in the easiest way in urban regions uh, supply uh, is because of the resources is is better feasible in in in, in rural regions just to point out the extremes so uh, distributing information approaches and 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 planning tools also uh, for neighboring ecosystems here we are then on the macro regional level uh, for example uh, austria is part uh, where i'm coming from in the danube in the alpine uh, but also in central europe uh, so to coordinate territorial ecosystems uh, and and to link them with uh, and, and on base on the functional ecosystems my screen doesn't move oh yes so thank you <laughs> thank you melissa um so just uh, on what i described uh i would be interested which uh, for for your region where you are uh, what your regional background uh, what is the most suitable approach for your region uh, if it's uh, the well-known instruments or if uh, you think that a hybrid uh, ecosystem approach uh, could be a more efficient solution. Well, that's uh, uh, surprising. <laughs> that's not what you were expecting, were you? I wasn't expecting that. Uh, I I expected the multi-level governance at top, uh, uh, but uh, the hybrid uh, at uh, at the end. So, uh, and macro level, top down, even on the second or so <laughs> okay i think the poll is yeah yeah i think we can conclude yeah so uh thank you for <laughs> for that and uh yes uh, uh if you want to get to know more about prospect 2030 you can visit our uh, very informative website on the Interreg Central Europe uh, uh, website <laughs> uh, and the content note Prospect 2030. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Manfred. Uh, well, yes, don't forget you can ask questions to Manfred in the chat or in Slido. We will have uh, another Q&A session soon. And uh, people that are joining the room on Minter planning and regional planning, uh, you will also have Manfred there to have a vivid discussion. Um, so thank you, Manfred. Now, last thank but you. not least, uh, we will uh, welcome uh, Maria Pietro Belli, uh, who is uh, uh, from the Center for Applied Research on Sustainable Development and the San Benet Benetto del Toronto Municipality. Uh, and she will tell us more about the Joint CGAP project. So Maria, 
I will give you control of your slides. Good morning to everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good morning. Thank you to everybody, to everyone who joined this meeting. I am Maria Pietrobelli coming from CRAS. It's a private research center in Rome that has been working since more than 20 years in the, in the field of environmental issues. We have been technical assistants of uh, San Benedetto del Tronto municipality in the framework of uh, joint SECA project. Is, uh, I just uh, remember to you, um, what, what is the contents of Joint SECA project? <clears throat> it promotes the collaboration among local authorities toward joint sustainable energy and climate action plan. It supported the, mun the municipalities along the planning process in defining joint action, specifically on adapt adaptation issues. And it comprises four Italian and four Croatian target areas, including the one led by San Benedetto del Tronto. Uh, but the, the, the focus, uh, the, the specific focus uh, for whom I'm here today is, the, 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 is that we suggested to include SIA procedure in the planning process. Since we were filling, the, filling in the application form to join the call, we thought that it would be a great uh, opportunity, a great ad added value to include SIA in the planning process. And I'm, I'm going to, to share with you some consideration of why this reason. So um, all, uh, all of us know that we have a European directive that governs the sector that show us that SIA procedure for SECAP fully falls within the scope of the law. But uh, we know that the, uh, the debate is very open in Europe and SIA application to SECAP is not taken for granted at all. So uh, let's say why uh, we, we think that SECAPs have to be submitted to SIA. First of all, SECAPs concern many of the fields mentioned by the norm, such as energy, transport, land use, etc. Second, second item is that SECAPs provide exactly the framework from, for works subject to further authorization procedures, including environmental impact assessment, such as, for example, flood defense, renewable energy plants, uh, transport infrastructure, and so on. So uh, we know that in spite of this, of this, uh, of this law, um, stake, stakeholders and community are divided concerning the C application to SECAPS. We tried to understand the reason of this different experience all around Europe, and we thought uh, which may be the reason for not to apply SIA to SECAP. Yes, Um, yes, we see that uh, SECAP are strongly oriented to environmental and energy sustainability. We see also that SECAP are voluntary plans, additional to the ones regulated by, na by national or regional laws. So this can be, these two aims, these two points can be uh, something that, uh, uh, like an ex a reason or an excuse, <laughs> depending from the point of view, to not apply the CIA procedure. But uh, maybe that when you, you draft a SECAP, you feel any way to work for environmental protection. And so you don't think that you need to apply CIA procedure, but that's not fine at all. Uh, in spite of their voluntary origin and environmental focus, uh, SECAPs should be submitted to C, as well as many other plans strongly oriented to sustainability, uh, like sustainable urban mobility plans, for example, or, or like the management plans of natural protected areas or the local energy plans. They are all plans uh, drafted at local regional or local level that um, 
for whom the SIA application is, is given for granted at all. But the European framework uh, around CCAP is not uh, homogeneous at all. We see very, very different law interpretation. Of course, we have some good example of CCAP uh, uh, submitted to SIA, for example, the one of the town of Milan in Italy or the town of Dundee in Scotland, but the framework is really uh, diversified. I, I just give you a, a short review now. You see in the green box uh, a short review of the of some uh, SECA peculiarities that for sure affect the C application. So I, I summarize it for you. First, take up um, push you two main environmental goals, as you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing resilience. SECAP mainly produce positive, positive effects on most of environmental components. SECAP is not prescriptive, so it doesn't affect directly the property rights. SECAP's combined measures from other planning and programming tools and SECAP include also many soft measures under the direct competence of the municipality that support the implementation of the former measures. SECAPs convey different financial results, resources to tackle climate change. So on the basis of these peculiarities, let's see which are the main opportunities uh, deriving from this year application. You see the, in the orange box, we say that SIA allows to describe explicitly the interactions of the planning measures with environmental components, both positive and negative, but especially positive, like we, like we saw before for SEGAP. SIA supports the definition of clear recommendation for the implementation phase of the plan. SIA strengthens the involvement of, the, of environmental authorities in the planning process, so as SIA improves the effectiveness of public participation. These last two are very important elements of SIA. So we can conclude in simple words, in simple terms, that the SIA application reinforces uh, the environmental benefits of SIA and enhance the administrative solidity to SECAP by greater involvement of the institution. So we have, we say that not only SIA is required by law, so it's mandatory for SECAP, but we can say also that SIA represents a great opportunity in applying in, in for SECAP because it helps them to elevate to increase the legal value of the plan. And um, for, on the basis of, of all this consideration, uh, the joint SECA project proposed a possible structure of the Scoping report that, as you know, is the first step of the SEA procedure. And uh, I don't have so much time now to go into deep of each of the one or of the eight points that you see in the slide, but all the, the target areas involved in the project drafted, drafted the scoping report. Everything is available, of course, on the project website. Thank you. Here we have the slide of questions. I don't know if Melissa likes to say something. Yes, the question sorry. Sorry, I moved a bit too fast there, but uh, yes, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Maria, uh, for this nice presentation. And of course, we invite people to uh, to answer this uh, final Slido question. No second. Are you surprised, Maria, or not? What no. were you expecting? Unfortunately, I'm not surprised because I know that it's very difficult for municipality to apply the C, the CIA procedure. 
and of course the people that are allocated to your group will uh, will be able to hear more about this and to see how they can do it if they're interested. Okay, I think uh, we do not have uh, uh, a lot more answers, so we can close uh, this poll. Thank you again, Maria. Now I invite all the speakers to, um, to turn on the webcam for the second Q&A session. Uh, oh yes, yeah, sorry, there was another question by Maria, but uh, please, uh, you can, uh, speakers can still uh, turn on the webcam. Uh, yes, so before the Q&A, we still have one question. I forgot about that one. Do you believe that applying SEA to SECAP could really make the plan more solid and effective? One is for not at all and five for yes, absolutely. And this will again be used for the fifth breakout session with the joint CCAP team. So Maria will be there, but also Nicola and Boyana will tell you more about uh, environmental assessment and the SEA approach. Mm -hmm. So people are convinced, but could be even more convinced. So let's let's see what uh, how this goes in the breakout session. And I look forward to hearing about the results from this session. Thank you, Maria. Uh, now let's move on, uh, as I said, to the, the final uh, Q&A before we go to the interactive discussion and breakout sessions. So please turn on the webcam. Um, I think there are some general questions there, but first uh, I want to, to ask questions to uh, speakers in particular. So uh, there was one for Tecla and Charlotte, uh, a specific one. Uh, if you know when the import and export function between EEA and the Covenant of Mayors will be available. Charlotte, do you want to answer? Sorry. Um, unfortunately, I would be happy myself if I would have, have the concrete answer to it as well. You can imagine that it's quite a complex um, process. We are now sort of in a feasibility study of how it could work. So I could hope for the end of this year, but I'm, I, I wouldn't promise anything. What I can already tell you is that now with the Come Easy tools, you can have sort of a, a full download of all the data you have, at least in the EA system, you then have to check if it works vice versa as well. And then you sort of just have to um, copy it into the COM system. So it's already quite closely linked, but it's just this automat the automatic part we are working on it as uh, fast as possible. And we'll hope it will come, come soon. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I see we also have quite a challenging uh, answer for Manfred. Uh, so academic type knowledge transfer is good, but won't help people to move forward as fast and sufficiently as required. How to organize this matter, Manfred? <laughs> yes. Um, it appears to be just academic type knowledge, uh, but in fact, what we are, what we are doing and trying to coordinate uh, in Prospect 2030 is to cope with very, very different conditions. And uh, as, as I pointed out, uh, uh, the energy system of the future will be a lot uh, more different than the one we have today. And in this case, the, also the approach needs to be uh, stressing out decentralized planning. Yeah? So we have to focus on decentralized planning and someone has to do the first steps. It was the challenge in our project. We didn't expect that challenge, uh, but it turned up and we had to cope with it and uh, find a solution. So someone has to do the first step, make proposals, try to do it in practice as we do it in, in Prospect 2030. Uh, so yes, maybe it's uh, knowledge of the future, maybe, <laughs> uh, but someone has to step in we have to and start somewhere. we did it. Yeah, you have to start somewhere. Perfect, thank you, Manfred. 
Um, so yes, we had this quite this very interesting question already in uh, the first Q and A. I think uh, yeah, Anna, Andriana, you can also turn on the the webcam, and I really would be interested to to hear about everyone on this one. So is the stakeholders' engagement a co-creation or a consulting process? What if the stakeholders and local government views are opposite? Maybe we can start with Anna because I know this is the topic from Pentahelix, but really I think all of your projects and initiatives deal with that. So uh, Anna, if you can start and then anyone who, who wants to say something can add. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you for, uh, for this question from the anonymous uh, participant. So indeed, the stakeholder engagement should be co-creation. And we always said it's important that um, this is uh, co-creation, that the stakeholders don't receive the measures at the end, that they uh, comments, if, even if they are not addressed, it should be explained why they are not addressed. In the case, if the views of the stakeholders and the local governments are opposite, well, um, in our, uh, at least in our examples in Croatia, we didn't have examples where there was like they were fully opposite uh, it's important that uh, some uh, that some win-win solution is uh, is there is um, found and um, in the case if uh, there is a really big um, fully opposite for example I don't know maybe um, municipalities prefers 40% uh, CO2 reduction till 2030 and some citizens or maybe NGOs prefer that those CO2 reductions are 60 or 70. In this case, I would say maybe unfortunately the, the local government will be the one who will have the final word if this is like a drastic, um, uh, drastic difference. But at least in those cases, it seems that um, this is something to address. And even if it's not maybe addressed in SECAP, this is some topping to think on and to work on uh, and finally maybe the agreement will be uh, done on the on the and the final uh, views will be the ones which are proposed by the stakeholders in the case of the smaller differences then uh, i think that at least in what we've seen in our cases then the agreement is usually uh, yeah done sometimes on the stakeholders uh, ideas but sometimes on the local government in case if also stakeholders understand and agree with this thank you anna anyone would like to to give their opinion on this matter yeah maybe maybe one point i would like to add here is that it is very important to communicate very carefully in this in this process because if if you involve citizens and finally don't follow their views then they will be disappointed. So you have to see where you can involve them really with their opinions and where uh, uh, you have to explain to them what you are doing because maybe maybe their influence on this is, is very slow because it's low, it's because it's it's driven by some, some uh, legal aspects or whatever. So it it's, needs to be a very clear communication and and uh, people should should feel that they are really taken serious, and that's that's an important point. Not just what I see in some cases, people were involved and their opinions were not taken serious, and then they fall out of the entire process. So it's clear to to show where can they be involved, where something is just to be explained, or where can they really really yeah act in. So that's that's very important to to divide. Thank you. That's a very good point. Anyone else? Okay, if there is no other from, sorry, <laughs> Melissa. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, from uh, from the C track exp fifty experience, uh, stakeholders engagement should ideally be a co creation process, um, but um, even a consulting or consultation process is is a positive step towards the right direction. So consulting with stakeholders, consulting with citizens in the different phases of, of the planning process, um, because that uh, that really, you know, helps them actively participate in the process and own the process as well. So, so feel that they're included um, in the in the plans and in the in, in the long term vision um, and um, in terms of if the views are opposite or there's uh, conflicting views, um, 
what we've seen so far is that uh, uh, going through a more extensive consultation process, there's usually uh, ways to um, uh, to to find solutions that um, uh, that that can uh, bring the views closer to to each other and uh, have uh, the overall agreement of stakeholders and citizens. Uh, so extensive discussions, extensive consultations. Thank you, Andriana. Uh, well, I would like to ask all of you one more question. Um, I think it will be relevant for all of you. And I'm sorry to bring a kind of negative topic and that everyone is talking about for a year and a half. But I think COVID-19 uh, mm -hmm. has been has had a big impact on climate and energy planning. Mm -hmm. uh, so I noticed that Anna mentioned that uh, the economic aspect is getting more important now. I know as well in C-Track 50, uh, it has been increasingly complicated for uh, the project partners to get in touch with the municipalities and mm -hmm. get moving with the planning. So uh, I would like to ask all of you if you think COVID-19 will still have a long lasting impact on climate and energy planning and if you already uh, addressed this issue and how to, to solve it. First one who would like to take the floor, please, please do. Well, I mean, COVID-19 is, 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 is a huge chance to change something, but we also, uh, especially for, I can say for, for Germany and for the project we are involved in, we, we realize that, that it is very hard for, for municipalities now to, to continue their climate policy, but they see also the chance to, to uh, really step into new, new process and to, to recover in, in a specific way and also with the new targets from the EU. And I think those who are very active before will, will go on with that. But, but there is for the, for the moment and for the last year, there was really uh, regarding staff capacities and so on, there was really a break in this. Thank you, Tekla. Uh, I maybe would like to add, looking now at the chances, I fully agree with Tekla, it was really a tough time and also I can fully understand that for, for some municipalities it wasn't highest priority, the topic in the last years, but I, I think now the chance we have is, for example, with recovery funds coming up, mm. with a restructuration of, of economics anyway, I always think energy and climate policy is not something apart, but you have to mm -hmm. integrate it in everything you do. So if you try to rebuild the economy partly now, mm -hmm. you just include the topic in it. And that's the big chance I see that now there's a momentum of with the, having the ambitious goals and with having recovery funds to get it in there in, into all these um, uh, programs that are now getting built up. But that's right now it has to happen. So I think now we have to take care that now that these plans are being programmed, now it's the moment to involve the topic in there. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to remind that still COVID-19 is bringing new opportunities as well and a new occasion to think about additional aspects. Anna, please. Uh, yeah, I would just add, I fully agree also with Charlotte. Uh, I think that um, at this moment, and with the Tecla, at this moment, uh, of course, the focus of municipalities is fully shifted from energy climate to the health topic to the economy topic. But uh, as uh, the next generation mm -hmm. fund, the recovery fund will for sure foster the, in, uh, the investments in energy and climate. Also, mm -hmm. I think that nowadays we are more aware of the importance of being independent of the being independent on energy, uh, of being independent even as we could see in uh, agriculture, in uh, material uh, goods, and also uh, as we could see in the States uh, due to this uh, lack of uh, gas, the, the issues they had and how, how it's, it's uh, so different, so unusual to see how things can change so fast and mm -hmm. uh, to see how uh, good it is to be ready in these uh, times and to be independent. So I believe that maybe at this moment there will be more focus on the health economy, but as uh, the situation will get better, they will be more aware of the importance of uh, being climate uh, and energy neutral. Andriana, please. 
I agree with uh, everything that's been said and just want to add that also um, uh, the last year our, our lives have has changed, our habits have changed, um, and this is also a new opportunity to keep some of the good habits yeah. and keep some of the good changes uh, that uh, that do lead to a more sustainable way of living. Um, so yeah, but that's the only thing I really did want to add because I think the previous speakers uh, covered the uh, uh, Manfred and yeah Manfred you're raising your hand please go thank you um, very very good contributions uh, now from from the I, I, I agree fully with them uh, but I want to also to point out that in some cases uh, the Austrian example for example example for example is uh, uh, for rebuilding economy uh, after the COVID uh, impact is that the programs that are now developed have a, are having a, a heavy focus also on, on climate change issues and energy issues. So the whole recovery plan, which is now elaborated by the government, is strictly bound also to, to energy efficiency, renewables, and, and to climate change mitigation. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, maybe uh, <laughs> sounds cynic, but uh, a positive aspect uh, of of all all the COVID issue. I wanted to contribute. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Manfred. Um, and then I would just like uh, to ask Maria if you want to add something, and I think we will close this uh, very interesting discussion in order to uh, to allow participants to to contribute in the breakouts. So Maria, any any final word? Oh, it's OK. We had a very interesting uh, presentation. It's OK. We, we will have a nice discussion now. Thank you. OK. Thank you, everyone. That was very interesting. I'm, I'm so happy that we got to have this uh, debate. It's uh, This first part was a nice introduction to what's coming. So uh, it was still very, uh, very intense. So uh, please, for now, go get a coffee uh, and come back in, in 10 minutes uh, at uh, 10.50 at the latest uh, to start the, the breakout sessions. So you have been allocated to, to a group. You have received an email from Livia, I think from EBN. Um, if you're not sure, just ask me in the chat. Uh, we will send you to the room soon. I will. Um, stop the recording for now because breakout sessions are not recorded. Welcome back, everyone. I think some of you uh, did not get the chance to conclude, but uh, this will give uh, the others who did not attend your conversation to to get a peek of what happened, I guess. Is everyone back now? It seems so. Perfect. Uh, so yes, uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we will now hear from uh, all the facilitators what happened in each room, and uh, I start with uh, Alexandra and Andriana. And it's also uh, the occasion for me to welcome Michele Sansoni from CINEA, who is Project uh, Officer of C-Track 50 and uh, who gave us the honor of joining this breakout session. Uh, so if you guys want to, to give us yes. some insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you very much, everyone. So in our session, we had the chance to go a little bit deeper on, on the challenges towards carbon neutrality. And uh, although it's uh, really difficult uh, to, in, in such a period to try to discuss all of them, uh, we, we think that there are the three main categories, uh, the political, let's say, challenges, the financial and the technical ones. And uh, there is also a, another category that it's um, other, or we could say that it's uh, cross-cutting or horizontal. Um, so in terms of uh, challenges, yes, indeed, there is uh, the lack of political vision, uh, as well as the lack of organizational structure uh, in the municipalities that uh, 
hinders uh, some of them uh, to make more ambitious uh, targets and committing to them. Uh, in terms of financing, of course, uh, the difficulty to raise funds was uh, raised uh, uh, as one of the most important, not most important priorities, but it was one of the significant challenges that was raised. Uh, also, how to, fund, uh, to finance uh, the additional resources that are needed at the municipal level, because uh, it's a, one of the cross-cutting challenges uh, that more people and uh, more people with uh, knowledge and background are needed at the municipal level in order to support uh, this transition process. Uh, so the lack of uh, resources to, to finance uh, this was also raised. Uh, also, the lack of experience and know-how with innovative financing approaches. Uh, we see gradually that uh, we are moving away from the rationale of uh, providing only grants to municipalities. So now it's uh, even more evident, even at the national uh, uh, programs that are being raised, that uh, the municipalities have to blend uh, the financing resources. They also have to address ESCOs or uh, to do energy performance contracting, uh, to launch um, crowdfunding or to participate to energy communities. So there are some different um, uh, opportunities in place. Uh, that uh, the municipalities uh, feel that uh, they are not uh, aware of, they don't have the necessary know-how and they don't have the necessary experience also in order to work on. Uh, also, uh, the issue on how to convince, because these are participatory uh, financing approaches, is how to uh, convince uh, people and how to engage them in contributing, for example, crowdfunding or in uh, engaging them on uh, contributing to energy communities to, for implementation of uh, renewable energy investments. Uh, concerning technical challenges, uh, we have, um, of course, the lack of technical know-how on how to exactly plan for the future, but we have also something that could be a little bit relevant to the financing on not could be, it is relevant to the financing on how you actually, from a technical perspective, uh, you prepare all the necessary documentation uh, and um, for tendering uh, uh, the specific uh, projects. Um, in, in terms of, um, it, it was also raised that uh, as an idea, uh, because it has been, uh, it has been uh, tested at uh, the pilot level, uh, how to engage your citizens uh, by offering them financial incentives, for example, by providing them a small, um, um, some reduction, let's say, to the municipal fees that they are paying uh, for when they are recycling or when they are increasing recycling rates. These are kind of some of the challenges that uh, municipalities need to see. And uh, we then progressed uh, to discussing a little bit uh, very quickly some priorities and needs. So we discussed how important it is to have model contracts uh, to see what are the synergies that can be created between the local authorities and other uh, local authorities in the region, but also regional authorities that could be actually supporting uh, their municipalities in this long-term planning process, especially considering the, the key role that regional authorities have uh, uh, in the planning in many countries, uh, as well as uh, the challenge to align the targets uh, or at the municipal and the regional level. Uh, we also had a presentation uh, by Michele uh, Sansoni, who informed us also on the upcoming um, opportunities for municipalities like the EU city facility that uh, many of the municipalities know about and uh, is closing now on the 31st of May and uh, also uh, about uh, the new uh, program uh, life that will be launched now in, in June and offers some uh, opportunities there as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, and my spy, Christine, informed me that maybe uh, participants in your group didn't get the chance to ask questions to Michele. Um, so I don't know if some participant would like to ask a question now, for sure, any question about life or UCF is relevant to the whole group. So uh, you can ask in the chat or take the floor. Um, but in the meantime, I guess I will move on to, to group two. So Anna, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, we had a lot of input in our breakout session. So it was, we even prepared more topics, but the 
yeah, uh, we had so many inputs that we stick to the main challenges with multi-stakeholder cooperation, but also we had a lot of ideas for solutions. So as some of the main challenges for the multi-stakeholder cooperation, we had example on the issues with stakeholders from regional national level for involvement on the regional local action. So here there was one example that agriculture in Belgium is important on local level, but farmers unions are organized on the national level, where uh, one idea for solution is to focus on action on regional level to be further broken down locally. We also uh, had um, one has raised one issue that local perspective differ because the stakeholders have quite different level of ambitions. Uh, companies do not uh, do a lot, but are more uh, reluctant to commit. And there is a lack of ownership. So there is one of the solution was to invest time in finding shared vision for the future when everyone uh, see themselves having a role. Uh, so as there was one question before, uh, in the Q&A session about what happens when there is uh, the opposite uh, view of uh, citizens, of the stakeholders uh, in comparison with the municipality. So uh, there was one suggestion from Belgium and this, this is to meet the ambitious stakeholders on the way to find, as they call it, Belgian compromise, for example, to rise ambition level in sector where this is possible. And also uh, that one of the solution is that the, the maybe the measure or commitment will not be in second, but the challenge of the stakeholders um, and these uh, municipalities can assist uh, in, the, in their implementation. Uh, furthermore, uh, we discussed about utilities companies have a much power but low urgency and there was a issue uh, that for solution was to introduce innovation process that are open for different stakeholders and utility companies and meetings and anchoring process with political level to, uh, to lead participation process. Uh, okay, I will shift further. So we also discussed a lot about the lack of dialogue between different sectors within the municipalities. So some of the ideas for solution was a lack uh, service recycling working groups to use groups established in other initiatives. Also a more dialogue and more involvement, direct involvement based on concrete actions. And uh, we discuss how co command of mayor coordinators and supporters can assist municipalities to solve issues. More dialogue between coordinators and between signatures uh, can support and could help. And there are need for several communication channels to make it easy also for the less engaged citizens to get involved. And it's important to uh, avoid resentment. And uh, it's important to manage expectations so people don't expect all suggestions to be implemented immediately. We also, one of the solutions was also to have individual dialogues before large discussion in or between larger groups. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, just to conclude, we also discussed challenge to explain for municipalities the importance of cooperation, lack of capacity for communication and for organizing the, for organizing the work and the meetings and access to finance. Uh, but yeah, as we said, there will be more uh, about the financing uh, in the next session and about the difficulties to get people to prioritize time to this work. So one of the very interesting idea we had is to include children and youth in the stakeholder consultation to have better discussion. As said, this, uh, this will break ice when discussing uh, to, for the discussion. Also, this will ensure that uh, the discussion is, um, that all of the participants behave when they discuss, so they, they are not um, bad words <laughs> mentioned during the discussion. And also, Sometimes uh, the, stake, the children are involved, but their parents or grandpas are not directly involved. But once the children are, are involved, they also start to be indirectly involved. Um, yeah, and also at the end, uh, we mentioned ideas that multi-level governance can help focus on evenings and unorganized stakeholders locally. This will, we mentioned this when we discussed how to find uh, the timing for different uh, groups of the stakeholders and also uh, Clements from Covenant of Mayor said that in June there will be a launch of annual survey for Covenant of Mayor's coordinators so yeah I, I use this last seconds to also to invite all COM coordinators to fill this survey. 
that would be for me. Uh, it was a bit challenging to summarize everything what we discussed because there were so many inputs. But quite impressive <laughs> in the 45 minutes to have uh, such results. Thank you, Anna. Um, now let's move on then to uh, European initiatives uh, where the Covenant of Mayors was presented as well and uh, discussed about also European Energy Awards. Tecla, Charlotte, Mariangela. Yes, uh, I would like to, to summarize, uh, as already said, that's really a challenge. Uh, we discussed European in initiatives, especially with their role in achieving the new goals and the challenges and opportunities for municipalities. And we said that these initiatives are an important support in, in achieving uh, these targets for municipalities. Uh, and municipalities are the right target group as, as they have close contacts to a lot of of uh, stakeholder groups uh, and a large scope of action, but they need a lot of support to get prepared to achieving these goals, which would be the, the role of these initiatives. And also it is necessary to create a bridge from the different levels of governments to, to the action and to act as a kind of a hub. Um, the new targets have an important role on both initiatives. Uh, uh, be it on uh, regarding the achievement of goals or the setting of new goals, but also in the organization of achieving the goals and the individual support of the different municipalities. Um, when it comes to the municipalities, uh, more efforts are needed to uh, reach the goals, but also quality in achieving these goals should not be forgotten. So it is not only reaching the goals, also the way how to achieve the goals. And uh, especially small municipality can also profit from, from uh, uh, increasing their ambition and uh, reaching climate goals by, by new opportunities, uh, uh, for example, in, in saving money and uh, energy. But there is also a certain reluctance in, in some municipalities It was described from Belgium as uh, it is not clear yet. And for some of the municipalities it is seems not to be realistic and we came to the conclusion that we have uh, a different different uh, starting points which needs to be taken into account in in this uh, in this process and it needs the inclusion of the private sector and the ngos to achieve the goals but also politicians uh, in the different countries need to take the responsibility and to support municipalities um, in, in order to create these this networks and to get the necessary uh, report, uh, support. Um, the support needed is, is not only funding, but it is also in, in, in advisory, advisory support is necessary in creating uh, more knowledge and uh, in order to be able to, to follow all the developments and um, smaller municipality might have uh, the problem, uh, lack of funding and lack of, uh, um, of um, capacities. Uh, and it is very necessary also to involve households and citizens, what is said. Um, the support of the region was, was, was her highlighted. And we discussed what is also a very important point conflicting topics like for example if in a region there is a high rate of unemployment there needs to be an entire vision and different aspects need to be brought together for example creating jobs by by an increased uh, uh, um, energy efficiency and investment in energy efficiency and climate policy uh, to to have a, a, a whole concept for for the region or for the municipality and not just working on on different different aspects so that uh, it's necessary to create a vision to bring different planning levels together in order to to be successful and it is very necessary and that's maybe as the last word that uh, um, municipalities need to be empowered and to be given a voice to define their targets and needs and to be to be the, uh, supported in their way so that's the result of our very active discussions we had thank you tecla that's quite dense as well so i understood that in group two belgians were an example to follow for their compromising skills 
but in group three, they were the reluctant country that needs to be convinced to be more ambitious. I think that's a good description of Belgians. I can say it in Belgian. Uh, it's said, it's said, it's said for some municipalities, and I guess we have we have the reluctant municipalities in all countries, even even in Germany, we have them. <laughs> I guess so. Thank yeah. you, Tecla. Uh, now let's hear about the regional perspective. So Silvia and Manfred, what happens in your group? Yes, uh, I, I will um, I will take the, the, the floor and um, I'm sharing uh, some notes I took. Uh, at the end, uh, the, um, most of the discussion uh, was uh, around the engagement of, of stakeholders that from a regional perspective uh, is for sure um, local authorities uh, and uh, and uh, other other uh, other stakeholders as well. But uh, um, so what we emphasized was uh, the need of a leading role uh, of, uh, of regions as territory coordinator, and we received some uh, some examples. Uh, uh, based on call for actions uh, and uh, aggregation options uh, for municipalities. Uh, um, the, the issue of uh, the small and medium municipalities uh, was raised uh, um, during the discussion. And, and uh, of course, uh, uh, one, one option is, uh, uh, is to have uh, a region that um, plays its role of governance in active way and, and call for action, the, the municipalities uh, uh, a way to to, to achieve uh, the the engagement, uh, but then we had also some some uh, good examples uh, on a different perspective uh, to put uh, the energy transition as a, a business model. I would say so to to bring uh, the the opportunities of the energy transition into into business and uh, and. Uh, um, play a little bit with the innovative solution uh, that brings together municipalities and citizens uh, together. So we had some exp examples from Austria about uh, how uh, TV installation can, can be um, can be funded by the citizens, uh, uh, having the municipalities as, uh, as uh, the, um, the promotion uh, uh, promotional actors uh, uh, in, uh, in this field. But also then we have the concept of energy co co communities and cooperatives, uh, which is also um, important to, to, to support uh, at, at regional level. And this brings uh, to another another point that we uh, that, that we touched uh, quite a lot, which is the social acceptance of renewables, uh, which is uh, most of the case issue uh, brings issue when we have to install big uh, uh, installations. And uh, of of course, we are aware that the carbon neutrality uh, target uh, um, will bring ahead this uh, this uh, this problem. We need uh, renewables to be installed. Uh, okay, we have the energy first principle, but then uh, it comes the, the need to have uh, additional power from, from the renewables. And this uh, is, a, is a, a big topic uh, at regional level where we have some uh, uh, issues uh, for, for the installation. So uh, again, some, um, some uh, ideas uh, that we stressed was uh, again to bring in somehow the the energy um, transition in the, in the business model, but also in the in the in the social acceptance uh, uh, procedures, so involving the citizens uh, as much as possible, of course, uh, and uh, and then we focus quite a lot about uh, knowledge and communication, uh, and we we see some innovative also examples from Germany about uh, uh, using virtual reality in order to uh, to convince or, or to to have a good uh, good communication tool uh, for, for for citizens in order to figure out what will be the impact uh, and, and uh, of, uh, of uh, installations uh, as well of course uh, we don't have time to go too much in, into detail and then uh, uh, we, we also touched upon the the the, um, the role of regions as a promoter of uh, private investment so of course uh, uh, European directive uh, provides uh, this uh, this role as uh, as example example for for the others for the public authorities 
but uh, uh, of course the most should be done then uh, uh, with with private money and uh, and uh, by the, the the private stakeholders the citizens the the, the the companies and so on so uh, what was uh, found out uh, is that um, it is very important to have good practices and pilot projects to show to people uh, in order to uh, ease the replication and uh, for example from from Croatian uh, member of, of the group uh, say we, we, it's very important now we have some good projects and good uh, uh, pilots that we can show that we don't have to go uh, to Germany for example to, to, to convince people that we have in, in, in our home uh, and, uh, and this is a uh, very important so to start with the with the good examples so, and then uh, of course the uh, this uh, this role of enabling uh, or creating the enabling conditions for the development of project by by regions uh, that, that should support the, the private investment as, as, as much as possible and then uh, uh, also the, the the need of creation of uh, one-stop shops as uh, as um, points where where uh, citizens can uh, receive uh, uh, information but also solutions to to to, to, to problems and uh, and speed up the, the, the investment from their side also as usual the 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 team of the financial support even though uh, this seems to be in a way also uh not solved but uh, we have in front of us a, a, a new um, a new Momentum uh, related to the recovery fund that uh, in some uh, in some countries uh, represented in the in the group okay for sure Italy but also Greece and other it, it's a, it is seen as a, a big opportunity that we need to 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 use at best and, and then another point that I want to to leave to you is is this cooperation among regions which is uh, it seems to be obvious uh, that uh, uh, we should learn from each other but uh, at national level it's not that uh, common practice and it is a pity because uh, for sure uh, it, it is very important to uh, understand and have a clear picture of what is happening uh, in the in the neighborhood and uh, and uh, the importance of uh, european project and transnational cooperation is uh, is for sure uh, considered uh, very valuable for for all those regions uh, working on that and uh, okay that's it uh, and, um, I don't know Manfred if you want to complement but um, for my side it's over hey, yeah thank you uh, Silvio I think that was also quite uh, quite uh, complete uh, so Let's move on to a group uh, five. We're a bit over time, so I, I hope you guys still have a, a few minutes uh, for Nicola, uh, Boyana, and Maria, and environmental assessment. Okay, uh, thank you, Melissa. I will just try to be as short as possible since we are behind time. So first greetings from this nice tropical beach. And uh, I will just try to share the screen number one to with the with the notes that we had okay okay uh, i hope you can see this so basically our discussion uh, was kind of divided into three main ways uh, first one was public involvement in the in the scoping process and in uh, general in the in the in the seca process and how it should be done because it, as we heard in the previous also uh, summary this uh, public involvement is really really important so uh, currently in the legislation there is no clear guidance on, on how to do this so uh, in the end this usually happens to be a formal uh, formal uh, just a for formality for for the SEA process and uh, one of the topics is was the, the focus groups which were great uh, in the joint SEC up uh, project and uh, that uh, kind of fostered the, the discussion between public uh, regarding the, these issues. The second topic we discussed was the what does uh, SEA process brings uh, to the development of uh, SECAPs and uh, here a lot of point was actually uh, pointed out, uh, it was pointed that uh, it brings transparency to the process and that uh, brings uh, a legal value to the development because this is an official document which uh, uh, 
different instances need, need to need to confirm and, and also it analyzes the compliance with other strategies and uh, other plans developed uh, both on uh, local, regional, national level. Uh, so you have this kind of a, a process of ensuring that the SECAP is in, in line with, with uh, everything. Uh, also, uh, the general public through this process get access to the documents at much earlier stage and has a few, uh, has an uh, view on uh, how it's uh, how it should be developed uh, what was also pointed out that uh, SEA procedure is complicated and it brings a lot of complication into the process but it also brings a lot of opportunities on how to upgrade the, the existing SECOPs and the SECOPs that are uh, that are uh, developed uh, and also it was mentioned that small municipalities have difficulties in implementation of SEA because of this complication in the procedure but uh, what uh, how this could maybe be resolved is maybe by joining uh, or having uh, more uh, support from regions or uh, national uh, level the third point uh, which was uh, uh, discussed was the environmental improvement which uh, through this process is uh, brought uh, into the secup and into and into the other environmental plans. So it was discussed that SECAPS contributes to objectives of other environmental protection plans uh, by increasing the, the biodiversity, by increasing, reducing different hazards, reducing uh, high temperatures and uh, so on. And also one of the things that was uh, pointed out maybe as one of the, the most important things that SECAPS should be uh, integrated into spatial and into landscape planning because uh, with climate adaptation measures, this becomes a very important uh, point into the developing of SECAPS. Okay, this is all for me, thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, well, that was uh, very interesting for me. Really, what I what I take out from this session is that uh, climate and energy planning and getting for ready for C for 2050 and for carbon neutrality, it requires uh, the skills and the support of everyone. It's not just for engineers and te technical people. You mentioned a lot communication. We came back to multi-level governance. If you would like to re-watch the, re the session from last week about this, I encourage you to do so. Of course, financing, which will be the topic of next Tuesday, is really important as well. Uh, but it's also region, citizens, everybody has a role to play. And uh, I really hope this kind of event uh, will allow to, to get everyone involved in, in the process. So thank you to everyone before you leave. Uh, my boss, Dominique, has reminded me several times to connect your webcams for the traditional group picture. Uh, so uh, congratulations for uh, making it until the end. You get to have your face uh, on the website of Federen. So thank you, everyone. I will do it now. Smile. Alexandra, you're not. Can you turn on your webcam, please? Ah, Thank you. We really need you for this one. Okay, first one. I have three pages, so I will try to be as fast <laughs> as possible. I don't want to keep you away from your lunch break. Okay, and one more. There we go. Thank you very much, everyone. Please uh, remember to join, uh, to register to the last session because the, the registration form is going to close very soon. We heard a lot about energy community, citizen um, crowdfunding, citizen finance. This is going to be discussed, one of the topics of next week. So really uh, go visit our website now and register. And uh, well, thank you for making it until the end and to the speakers and facilitators. This has been great from my side. I hope for you to enjoy your break and see you next Tuesday at 9.30. You have 30 more minutes to sleep next Tuesday. Goodbye. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Melissa. Bye. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you.